Okay, should I go ahead and get started? Yeah, to stay on schedule, I think we should. Um, okay. Victoria, take it away. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm Victoria Polchinski. I'm a UX designer within uh, University Technology Office at ASU. Uh, started my career as a front end developer at General Motors. So I have um, some development background as well as design background. Um, as I go along this presentation, feel free to chime in at any time, ask questions, um, make comments. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit first about some of the guiding principles, uh, contrast ratios and color, typography and spacing, uh, writing and graphics, and tools and resources. And sorry, there's a little bit of background. There we go. Okay. Um, so first off, guiding principles. Uh, Kathy touched on this this morning, but um, there are four main guiding principles. So first off is perceivable. So content must be perceivable. Um, and this is beyond, um, you know, visual perception, also auditory and tactical, tactile. Um, what I really like about these principles is that they really focus on, they're for accessibility, but they're really about, um, I think, really creating great user experiences, no matter what someone's capabilities. So operable, um, interface, Interface elements in the content must be operable. Um, so this includes things like tapping, keyboards, and voice commands. Um, again, so even though someone um, might operate a keyboard because they need to, super users like developers also use a lot of keyboard functionality. So this is something that helps everyone. Understandable, um, so things are readable, uh, they're predictable, and help users avoid and correct mistakes. And then robust, so um, you know, technologies can really stand the test of time. Um, this is really about you know, writing good code, um, semantic HTML, things that um, you know, major operating systems, browsers, and devices can all understand. So first off, contrast ratios. Um, a lot of you have probably worked a little bit with contrast ratios or are familiar with this. Um, starting with text. So normal text, um, this is anything below uh, 14 point bold or 18 point normal. Um, I, whenever I see the PT, a lot of times I mistake it for pixels. Uh, 14 points is actually a little bit bigger than 18 pixels and then 18 points is a little bit bigger than 24 pixels. Um, so the, the standard for AA is 4.5 to one and that's what ASU is supposed to comply with. Um, and then for large text, we have um, three, three to one ratios. So to start off, um, if everyone can kind of participate in a little bit of a poll um, to kind of guess, you know, which, um, which of the following will meet contrast ratio standards, uh, you can go off mute, you can write in the chat if you want. Um, this is just kind of informal, but if you're not familiar with contrast ratios, feel free to, to say whether you think they're just easy or difficult to read. So any thoughts on this first one? Pass or fail? Um, let me look at the chat. Fail, awesome. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll kind of um, wait till the end to mention which ones pass and fail. So the next one, any thoughts, pass or fail? Seeing a lot of fails. Um, so third, pass or fail? Iffy, <laughs> I like that. Um, lots of fails too. What about number four, pass or fail? Lots of passes, cool. And number five, pass or fail? It's looking like everyone, <laughs> that, that one seems like a clear failure. So um, surprisingly, uh, these all passed. So, um, you know, the the reason I wanted to go over this was to kind of talk about, you know, beyond compliance um, and kind of go back real quick, even though these, these, for the most part, um, like people thought that they failed. Um, these are actually all passing. They all have a 4.5 to one uh, contrast ratio standard. So 
um, it's important to note that even though something might pass contrast ratios, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're easy to read. Um, so as you're designing, as you're developing, definitely use that 4.5 as a minimum, um, but also just kind of think about, you know, how easy or difficult is this to read. Um, so to, to kind of go beyond that, so avoid just passing compliance too. So like I said, the 4.5 to 1 is a minimum standard. Um, what happens a lot is we'll use like kind of medium middle grays um, to de-emphasize text. Um, the hex code 757575 is a common example of that. Um, and over on the, the right hand side, you can see this passes. Um, but if you use a very light gray background or even like a, a sort of light gray background, um, this will fail contrast ratio standards. So it's really important to keep in mind that even though something um, passes in one instance, it doesn't mean it'll pass in all. Um, and even if like this background color is, is extremely light, um, but it's just, you know, if you use those middle gray tones, it's easy to accidentally fail those standards. Um, so this, use good judgment, um, kind of like we, we saw in that poll, um, passing contrast ratios can still be difficult to read or even very difficult to read. Um, so if you and your users um, have trouble reading something, really, you know, push yourselves to figure out um, different color combinations. Um, I know within ASU and within most brands, there's always, um, there's always some challenges with finding the best ratios that meet brand standards and um, color, um, color contrast compliance. Um, but really, when we're, when we're designing, when we're developing, and when we're putting content on the web, it's for everyone to use. So it's important to kind of step back and think about um, how easy things are to, to look at, even if, even if they pass. Um, avoid too much contrast. So um, there have been studies that also show that too much contrast can lead to eye strain. So avoid using pure black text on pure white backgrounds and vice versa. So contrast ratios with user interface or UI components. So what are UI components? Um, this, these are content that's perceived by users as a single control for a distinct function. So examples of these are form elements, buttons, links, um, user interface component requirements um, require a minimum of three to one contrast ratio. Um, so for inputs, um, like we have a first name, uh, there's an input box, uh, this would not pass contrast ratio standards because it's a really light gray and it doesn't meet that three to one contrast ratio standard. Um, so just, you know, again, test, test the border color, test the background color. This is also true for focus and selected states. Uh, they also need to pass the contrast ratio standards. Uh, so, so disabled UI components are exempt. This, this would include things like disabled controls like buttons. Um, if you go through and you read the information on the WCAG guidelines, it, it almost sounds as if they're like, they're exempt, but be very cautious when you use them. Um, right now, there's not like a great, there's not a great way to, um, to kind of accommodate this for people who um, have low vision. So, I would say use this with caution and really try to challenge yourself to think like, do we need a disabled um, UI component or is there something else that would solve that problem for us? Because someone with low vision uh, might have a really hard time seeing a disabled button and they might not get those cues that they need to know that, hey, I needed to fill out um, the email address in order for this button to become enabled. So contrast ratios with graphical objects. Uh, so what are graphical objects? Uh, these are things like stand standalone icons, such as print icons with no text, um, and also the important parts of more complex diagrams um, and infographics. So these also need to pass the three, three to one contrast ratio standard. Um, if, you use, if you use icons, 
for a control or um, to help communicate something on your page, uh, that's when they need to have that minimum standard. If they're only for aesthetic reasons, they don't need to meet any sort of minimum. So over here, we have the welcome to the print center with just a bunch of print icons all over that. That's just a pattern for um, like, it's just a fun visual. It's not communicating anything. So that's not required to pass the three to one standard. Um, other examples, uh, so with a magnet, there's like two parts of, there are two different like graphical objects here. There's the U shape and then there's like the tip of uh, the magnet. Um, so both, both of those need to be distinguishable and have a three to one um, contrast ratio standard with both the background and with, so here um, there's a, you know, white tips with red that meets that three to one contrast ratio standard. So that passes. Um, and in this example, this fails, there's only a U shape. So we can't understand just a U shape as a magnet. This could be many different things. It could be like someone's hair, it could be a U, it could just be some sort of, um, some sort of symbol or logo. And graphical object gradients. Um, so the rule here is if you remove the lightest part of the gradient, can you still understand um, what is being communicated? So in the case of a information icon, um, if you remove the light section, you can no longer see the eye and it doesn't make sense. So in this case, this one would not pass. So graphical objects bar graph examples. Um, this one fails and it fails because these lines, um, they align with uh, the numeric values for this bar graph. So without being able to perceive these lines um, because the contrast is too low, we, we, can't, we can't really see exactly what, um, what these different bars represent. So there are um, three different graphical objects here. There's the lines, there's the bars and then there's the key. And so each one of those needs to meet that three to one standard. To improve, um, to improve this and to make it so that it does pass, you could have um, numbers within the bar graph um, and then that eliminates the need for these lines to communicate because you're communicating the actual number within the bars. Um, and you know, this is another example where it's a lot easier to see that team one um, scored 24 points and team two scored 36 while having the number within the bar than it is to try to align this and guess what the value might be, no matter what your abilities are. Um, pie charts. So <laughs> this is, um, pie charts can be really tricky. Um, they're, they can be difficult for anyone to perceive, um, you know, the, the, proportion of each slice. So in this case, um, this fails because not only do, does each one of these colors need to make, meet the contrast ratio with the background, but it also needs to meet the contrast ratio with, um, with each slice. So the, the yellow and the red need to have that three to one standard. The red and the blue need to have it um, and so on. So in an example like this, um, one, there are tools out there to kind of help with data visualization. Uh, Adobe actually just launched a color tool for um, GAD, and I didn't include it in this, this presentation because they just launched it today. Um, but I think if you go to colors.adobe.com, um, you can see there's like a new accessibility feature where they'll, you can create palettes. Um, that meet like different contrast ratio standards and uh, color blindness sim simulations. Um, so, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, if you separate each piece of this pie out and you put the different percentages, so let's say we say team four is 40% and you separate it out, um, the different contrast ratios don't, don't communicate the information at that point, so it would pass. And exceptions to this um, to this rule, so logos and flags, um, you know, the McDonald's lo logo and the Bangladesh flag, um, they can't be represented any other way, so they don't need to have the the three to one standard. Same thing with photographs, and then representing other things. This is the term used on the on the site, um, very technical. 
Um, but screenshots, for example, don't need to, um, to meet these standards. Um, diagrams of medical information, so there's an illustration of, um, of an eye. Um, those don't need to meet the standard. And then um, color gradients like heat maps don't either. Uh, some general color considerations. Um, so don't use color alone to communicate and um, don't reference colors. So um, one, not everyone can see the colors on the screen. And then people with color blindness might perceive, um, they perceive color differently than, than the general population. Um, what's becoming more and more common is people also use um, like dark mode and night mode. And this can completely change the way um, colors look on your screen. Uh, there are a lot of different browser plugins that do this. Um, and, and this is um, a screenshot of one of the, um, one of the UI elements on ASU.edu. Uh, it looks completely different when you don't have the plugin engaged, but it's, it, it can be hard to read. So this is just another consideration. Um, the first thing um, component up here. This is using a um, color blindness simulator. So um, the idea here is that it's using red, what, what a lot of people perceive as red, um, but someone with color blindness, they, they can't see the red, so they don't necessarily know that that means that there's an error. Um, so it's important to also have like error messages and um, icons to help communicate when there is something wrong. Does anyone have any questions about color, color contrast be before we move on? Good, okay. So typography and spacing. Um, first off, capitalization. So avoid using all caps. Um, what happens with this, uh, with using all caps is it reduces the word readability. And that's because um, in this hello world example, you can see that all the block, all the letters are very blocky. So there's not as much distinction distinction, excuse me, distinction as there is um, with using um, both uppercase and lowercase characters. Uh, this makes it a lot harder for people, especially with, um, with certain cognitive disabilities to distinguish each word. Uh, if you do need to use all caps, uh, make sure you use the CSS text transform property. Um, if you just spell out all caps, like, in HTML, for example, a lot of times screen readers will um, read this incorrectly. So instead of it just saying hello world, they'll, they'll read out H-E-L-L-O. Um, obviously, if you have a lot of all caps, and even if you just have a little, this, can, this would be really frustrating. Uh, text alignment, so don't justify text. Um, because it creates like these rivers of white running through the page. This isn't a super extreme example, but you can see um, there's pretty large space gaps between each of the words. Um, and this can, this, you know, hinders readability for all, but especially for people with um, things like dyslexia. Line spacing, so use a line spacing between 1.5 and 2 within paragraphs. Um, this really depends on the font you're using, the font size, what the ideal number is, um, but this helps with readability for all, and especially important for people with dyslexia and ADHD. Um, and use the CSS line height property um, to, to give different line heights. I should also mention this is for um, this is specifically for paragraphs, so like long blocks of text. Um, it's not necessarily true for like labels and that sort of thing. Uh, paragraph spacing, so spacing following paragraphs um, should be at least two times the font size, and you can use margin bottom property for this. Paragraph width. Um, so the guidelines say use a max paragraph length of 80 characters. Um, this is actually a bit longer than a lot of graphic design recommendations, which I typically read are more like 55 to 70. And if we have any other graphic design experts um, on the call, feel free to, to chime in there. Um, but paragraphs that are both too long and too short can be really difficult to read. Um, it's easy to lose your place on things that are too long and then too short, you're just constant, you, you slow down because you're constantly moving to a new line. Uh, you can set the CSS max width to 70 M's for um, a comfortable, comfortable reading length. And that's more in line with the 80 characters. So depending on your font, you might need to like adjust this a bit. 
and then resize text. So um, text can be resized without assistive technology up to 200%. Um, you can use uh, proportional uh, units, CSS units to, um, to do this. So using things like REMS or M's. Um, avoid horizontal scrolling on resize. Um, and to do this, it's really simple. You can just um, increase the, the percentage within your browser and to, to see how everything scales. And then uh, avoid clip truncated, obscured, and overlapping text. So um, the screenshot shows a bunch of overlapping and clipped content. Obviously, this makes it really hard to, um, to understand and to read when you resize resize your, um, the text in your browser. And then for spacing, so touch targets, um, larger text targets, they really help everyone. They help people with our hands, those with unsteady hands, but also, I mean, a lot of us use our phone with only one hand, so it really helps with that greater precision. Uh, the minimum uh, recommendation is 44 by 44 pixels. Um, and then the, also note, the rule doesn't necessarily apply for um, text within body, but make sure there's still enough space around, um, around links and stuff so that people don't accidentally click on the wrong thing. Um, and then I see a comment, can you explain clipped, truncated um, text, et cetera? So clipped, uh, clipped is when it's like cut off. So in this image, there's a 0.34, and I'm assuming this is seconds, but it's just clipped. Um, now that I'm, now that I'm like thinking about it, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure I can like explain, anyone on the call can explain truncated and obscured. I'll get back to you on that. Um, let's see. Um, but obs yeah, obscured I think is kind of like when it's, when you have just like, yeah, I, let, let, me, let me wait till I can give you a better definition and I'll send it over. I think this is Deborah Pruitt. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> um, I think truncated and clipped are kind of the same thing. Um, usually truncated means it's like clipped off on the top mm. and clipped is kind of clipped on the side. So that's my understanding, but Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, and I will definitely kind of do a little bit more digging into the obscured. I feel like that's probably if the proportions are kind of weird or things look funny, but uh, definitely make sure to double check. Thanks for, thanks Deborah for that explanation. Um, so writing and graphics. Uh, keep content clear and concise. Um, so write in short, clear sentences and paragraphs, uh, avoid any um, really complex words or phrases, um, expand acronyms on first use, and I definitely recommend using things like a Hemingway app or Grammarly to check grammar, fluency, and sentence structure. Uh, these are free tools. Uh, Grammarly, I know, has a paid version as well, but you can still learn a lot about the readability um, of, your, of your content without um, using the paid version. Um, another thing to know is, you know, English isn't the first language for everyone. Um, and we, most people just kind of skim on the web. Um, so the, the simpler you can keep your content, the better. Um, and it'll just help people, it'll help all people just understand what it is you want to communicate. Uh, let's see. So Provide clear instructions. Um, make sure instructions, guidance, error messages are clear, easy to understand, and avoid any super technical language. So, for example, on an error message, um, don't just say like 404, 404 error. Um, expand on that. Help people understand how to fix it um, so that they can get to where they need to be. Uh, describe input requirements like date formats and don't describe UI component locations. So if someone can't see the content on a screen um, it, and you say use the navigation on the left left to jump to new sections, um, you know, that, that doesn't work for them. So up here we have uh, just a simple name input uh, with only including name. Um, it's like, do I just include my first name? Do I include my full name? Um, is that first and last? Do I put my middle name in there? 
Um, and then th there's no indication to, to tell the user whether or not it's required text or optional. Um, so the more specific you can be, the better. Uh, the other benefit of this is you also kind of collect um, cleaner data this way if, you, if you're more specific. Um, let's see. And let's see. Jeremy said, I believe clipped will be text that is cropped in some way. Truncated will be when you lose information because there's no room to display it. So the text is cutting off early. And obscuring is when it is covered by other text or images. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. And Laura, yes, I will definitely provide the link out to everyone later for, for reference, um, the, the link to the PowerPoint. Let's see, so for headings, uh, use short headings to group related paragraphs and clearly describe sections. Uh, make headings descriptive to give users an overview of the site content and the organization and don't skip headings for styling reasons. Um, this is an example from, um, I believe one of the WCAG tutorials. Uh, and they also note that here you have disaster preparation and then um, they're very specific. So you have flood preparation and then fire preparation instead of like preparation for flooding or preparation for fire. And you can kind of see how this just reads very easily and clearly uh, and how easy that is for both, um, you know, users who can see and those using a screen reader. So uh, links, uh, differentiate links in the body of the page um, with underlines or something other than color alone. Uh, kind of like what I was seeing earlier, not everyone can see the, the colors super easily. People with low vision or color blindness might not be able to perceive um, the link text with the body text. Uh, write link text so it describes the content of the link target and avoid using things like click here, read more. Uh, this, the, one of the things I really like about this is it also just makes the sentence a lot easier to read. Um, one thing I've been trying to do lately is put this more and more in like my own work or even in emails. I try to make the link text uh, more meaningful instead of just saying click here or just putting a URL. That's kind of been good practice for me to, to get better and better about writing good, meaningful um, links. Let's see, so graphics. Um, first off with icons, so avoiding Avoid using icons alone to convey meaning. Um, Nielsen Norman Group has a really great article that expands on icon usability. Um, but one of the things with icons is people can interpret them in a lot of different ways. Um, we have, you know, very large international communities at ASU too who might have, you know, different perceptions of what those icons mean based on like the technologies that they're used to do using. Um, I believe this is a list icon, um, but it's, you can see it's, it could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Um, so if you're using it like strictly to convey meaning, um, just be very cautious when you do that. Not all icons are super clear. Um, if you're using icons purely for decorative reasons, you can use Aria Hidden True. Um, and ASU uses Font Awesome and the rules vary depending on whether you're using like a web font or SVGs. So um, I just linked to more information about accessible semantic icons. There's a ton to go over there. So I didn't feel like I'd have the time to really go into that in detail within this presentation. Uh, images. So most images need um, alt text that provides the information or function of the image. Um, for purely decorative images, you don't need to write anything, but you still need to put an alt tag and you can leave it blank. Um, and then alt text should be brief, so less than 125 characters. Um, the image displayed here, um, so it's, it's important to also convey what the image is um, saying. And I think writing really good alt tags, this, this is like a art, a craft um, that takes time to develop. So, you know, saying ASU football fans, like, yes, that's what they are, but really the equivalent equivalent content is that football stands filled with AC students yelling and giving fork and devils hand signs. So that really um, communicates what it is um, sighted users can see. Animations, so, um, you know, it's really important to use animations in a cautious way. Um, 
you know, they can be, they can be really, really, um, you know, difficult to, to look at for people with like ep epilepsy, um, you know, migraine sensitive, sensitive, excuse me, sensitivities and cognitive disorders. Um, I don't know if, e even for me, like sometimes on Slack, if there's a, um, an animated GIF or even like the little icons and they're just going, I have to like close down Slack because I can't like take my eyes off of that. Um, if an image starts automatically and moves for more than seconds, there must be a way to pause, pause the movement. Um, and so this applies to element transitions, animated GIFs, um, parallax scrolling. That's, that's one that we don't necessarily think about as being animated, but the movement, the, um, the varying movement of the foreground and the background can like make people dizzy. Um, it can trigger migraines. It can make it so that people have to like go and lay down and like can't look at the screen for a while. Um, so just things to consider with animations. And then as far as tools and resources go, um, there are a lot of great uh, design program plugins. So Stark um, is great for contrast ratios and colorblind blindness simulators. Um, and it's available in all the major um, design programs. So Adobe XD, Sketch, and Figma. Uh, colorblind is, uh, I'd say, a more it has like every color blindness simulator um, in a free version, and that's available for Figma. And then Focus Order, I'm really excited about this one. Um, this allows you to annot annotate your designs to specify a focus order within Figma. So I think this really helps um, like designers think at the very beginning of the process, like what is the logical order for like say tabbing through. Um, through your designs, and I think that can really help keep um, keep accessibility in mind throughout the entire process. Uh, browser plugin, so No Coffee is a vision simulator available for Chrome and Firefox. It has all different vision simulators, low vision, um, like floaters, color blindness. Um, Wave uh, helps. Both Wave and Site Improve help evaluate uh, content for accessibility, and they're they're available for Chrome and Firefox. Um, earlier, Kathy mentioned Kathy Marks mentioned that Site Improve is what she would recommend. Um, and then ASU also has uh, ASU UTO also has a bunch of great resources on web accessibility at ASU.edu, um, and so I have links within the presentation, which um, will be available to everyone. Are there any questions? Hey, Victoria, this is Caramel. Hey, Darian. I think you did an excellent job on your presentation. I have a couple of questions and comments. Um, so I'm not sure if I just didn't understand this, but can you explain the uh, contrast ratios? Like, I don't understand, like, what does three to one mean? Like, what does that mean visually? Good, good point. Um, so and I can also include um, a contrast ratio checker within this presentation. Um, what does it mean visually? So I guess first off, um, WCAG has done a bunch of like different research into like different luminance and like how, how that ratio is actually created. So they're the ones who have created this formula that spit out um, the contrast ratios, which which state like how much um, I guess how much contrast or difference there is between um, a fore foreground and a background color. Um, so, for example, like black on white, that has the highest contrast ratio standard of twenty one to one. Um, and I can even pull up. Um, I use this Web Aim contrast checker a lot. Um, can you all see the contrast checker? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a great tool to just kind of easily test your foreground and background colors. Um, this is their default, the, this blue on white. Um, and you can see as you move the slider, um, the contrast becomes lower and lower. Um, and as you increase it, it becomes higher and higher. And so this tool is really great for telling you like whether the normal text, the large text, and then it also just recently came out with the graphical objects and user interface components, whether that passes the standards. Um, does that help answer your question? I'm sorry, I didn't mention that as much earlier. 
That is such a cool tool. Yeah, that totally answered that question. Um, I just have uh, four quick questions after that. Um, I was wondering, um, or actually I wanted to mention when you were talking about overlapping text, I noticed that a lot in Facebook. If you pinch zoom on Facebook, you'll see that the ads overlap onto your timeline. And I think it's so bizarre that there's such a, you know, quote, successful, you know, um, you know, business, but they, they still like fall victim to this very like archaic issue of overlap text. It, I thought that was great that you brought that up. And um, about um, when we were talking about clip text or truncated text or whatever, um, does that apply? So for example, when you use uh, iOS and you increase font size, and let's say you're going through your settings, some of the settings uh, no longer display the full name, like it'll just kind of cut off. Is that what that is? Yeah, that, that would be, um, yeah. And I'm not sure if, I'm not sure like the extent to which these rules apply to um, iOS, but I mean, really, if, if text is getting cut off, then that's gonna be more difficult for, for everyone. Yeah, so does, is there like a solution for that? Like what would that solution be that you have a very increased font size, for example, and then, I mean, how do you display that information to the user? Like, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, that's tricky because especially if you're using like one of the older iPhones and, and you're, the width of your screen is pretty small, um, yeah. that, you know, that could get tricky. I think one thing would be wrapping the text um, instead of just completely cutting it off. Um, and there, like I know with CSS, there are ways to make the text wrap instead of just, you know, clipping. Um, that would be my first guess, but I mean, it's, some of these issues are very complicated. And I feel like as yeah. I was creating this presentation, I'm like, I feel like I could create an entire presentation on almost each slide. Um, but that, that would be my initial guess. Um, oh, okay. Got would it. be just wrapping it. Mm -hmm. And and by wrapping, do you mean like um, like old like theater moving text, or what do you mean by wrapping? Um, so wrapping. So let's let's say for the word enter. Um, let's say you had it zoomed so much that only the e, n, and t could be displayed within the width of your screen. Um, mm -hmm. There would probably be like a hyphen after the t, and then the e, r would be on the next line. Oh, okay. That's really neat. Yeah. And I don't know that, um, like that would just be my best guess. I think I'd have to do a little bit more digging to see if there's a better solution for that. Um, but at a certain screen, at a certain, you know, if you have a really small screen size and you have your text blown up, you're going to end up with some other usability issues like that. Yeah. Okay. This my last comment, this is my last one. And then you guys, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to say it's super important that you acknowledge cultural differences and accessibility there. I think that's really important and it's not necessarily a disability at all, but it's like neat that it's, it falls under accessibility and that's all I have to say. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you for all the questions and comments. Hey, Victoria, this is Deborah yeah. again. Um, yeah. In CSS, you could use overflow wrap and then there's something called break word. So it's awesome. break dash word. And then you can specify um, whether it's an auto break. So it just automatically decides to break wherever, or you can set it to break um, with hyphens. Perfect, awesome. Thank you. I thought there was something like that, but um, I do not use CSS as much in my day-to-day -day life anymore. So I can remember off the top of my head. Thank you for that. I have a question. Can you share the link to that Nelson study about just using images to define information or yes. convey information? Yes, definitely. Um, and I think it's all about icons. Um, yes, it was icons using mm -hmm. icons alone. Yes. I will definitely do that. I'll share that in the chat right now. And then I think the, I don't know if the presentation that was shared out with everyone is, um, I feel like that might be. Um, it's the on the website. 
Okay, I, let me share um, the Google slides too because I had put um, I had put all the like links in there in the footnotes, and then I realized this morning with PowerPoint it didn't like copy over those hyperlinks. So let me just do that right now. Okay, so that's the the Nielsen Norman group icon usability and then the the drive presentation. Any other questions, comments? I have, I, I've used, for years, I've used a uh, Totally plugin on Chrome. Is that something that's not advisable to use anymore? Just as a quick check, not as a developer. I mean, Site Improve gives you a lot of really good detail, but just as a really quick check, I just, I've used that. Um, I haven't heard of that one. I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily bad. Um, there's so many plugins available to um, help with accessibility and some of them are more robust than others, but I, I feel like sometimes those really simple ones can be helpful for just like a quick scan. Um, I have a bunch actually like up here, like of color pickers and contrast ratio checkers and um, I kind of like to use different ones for different purposes. So I definitely encourage everyone to kind of explore the different options they have and see what works best for you. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, doke. Well, that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions or you want to, um, you know, you have more comments or want to share anything, I'm always open. Um, you can Slack me or email me. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Victoria. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you.